All right, guys, hope you're doing well. Today, we're going to be looking at Chapter 2 from our textbook, The Essentials of the U.S. Healthcare System, the 5th edition. And today, we'll be talking a little bit about the foundations of the U.S. healthcare delivery system. Um, just a reminder, guys, this is a supplemental lecture to assist you not only in your learning, but also in the brainstorming process for your writing assignments and hopefully contribute some insights into your current career or the career that you're aspiring for upon graduation. And so feel free to listen to this and use it as needed, whether that's uh, driving or while you're doing chores around the house. But always remember that the textbook is primary. All right, so with that being said, let's go through some of the points of chapter two. All right, so looking at the beliefs, the values, and health. First, starting with curative medicine. So curative medicine has a decreasing return in health improvement as it progresses with increased health care expenditures. So this is kind of a baseline principle for you to understand in the progression of health care and also understand, especially within the U.S. health care system, that there are many strong forces at work against fundamental change in the financing and the delivery of healthcare. So it's really important in your writing um, when you're arguing for a case um, for or against a policy that you understand that there are many strong forces at work and so we really need to bring a strong argument to the table when we're trying to make change and at the same time we need to think of the ripple effect, the effect that we talked about last time Remember, this is a system, so it happens on one side as an impact on the other side of healthcare. So we want to try to try to make it as win-win as possible when we offer solutions in our writing. All right. So as we talked about last week, in the United States, or rather the last chapter in the United States, we do not have a tax-financed national healthcare um, program, unlike many other nations, particularly those in Europe. And it's important that we understand that there are many social and cultural norms that explain not only how we view health care, but also how we view illness and expectations. For example, uh, here in East Texas, many men, especially those from the World War II generation, will stubbornly refuse to see a physician for really um, bad diseases. I've seen patients with their feet falling off with diabetic feet infections and they just refused to come to the physician because they wanted to tough it out, right? That is an example of a societal or a cultural norm that explains how they view illness and what their expectations are. Now, um, also understand, we'll talk about this in a little more detail, but recently societal values have shifted to what they call a social justice mindset, and that is becoming more predominant. I'd probably say on the, um, on the coast, the West Coast and the East Coast, but it is becoming more dominant here in the central United States. Know that the um, We're going to talk about the definitions of health now. There are various definitions, and so the medical or biomedical model of health really focuses on the absence of illness or the absence of disease. And so this model emphasizes clinical diagnosis and medical interventions so that they can either treat disease or the symptoms of the disease and have some type of diagnosis in order to provide some type of medical intervention, whether that be through medicine or through actual procedures. And so optimum health, right, that exists according to this definition when a person is free of symptoms and or that person does not require any type of medical treatment. So the Society for Academic Medicine defines health as being a state of physical or mental well-being that facilitates the achievements of that individual and their ability to contribute to societal goals. So you can have a lot of people who are physically healthy but obviously not mentally healthy and vice versa. And so if we look at the biopsychosocial model of health, um, we see a definition from the World Health Organization, also known as WHO, and they define health as being a complete state of physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease. And I'd say that's probably a much more well-rounded 
definition given the rise of mental health disorders, especially in the United States. And so the WHO defines a healthcare system as all the activities that have the primary purpose or aim to promote, to restore, and to maintain health. So what is a holistic health approach, right? This is where we're looking to treat the whole person, uh, often incorporating alternative therapies. There are physical, mental, social, and spiritual aspects. And I think for us as Christians, there's many of examples of this in Scripture on how the spiritual state of our souls can um, affect our body and our mind. And according to the lecture in the textbook, there's lots of literature that shows that religious and spiritual beliefs actually have a very positive impact on overall well-being. In fact, there's lots of research to show that people who regularly attend service and worship in small groups actually live longer and score higher on mental health and have a higher ability to handle adversity. And so it's very... Uh, very well researched and understood. And so uh, your spiritual beliefs can affect the incidence, the experience, and the outcome of even the most basic and most common of medical problems. And so illness is identified by a person's perception and evaluation of how he or she is feeling, whereas disease is going to be based on a professional evaluation. And those two don't always necessarily align, uh, they can be different. And so it's possible to have a disease without feeling ill, and it's possible <clears throat> to feel ill without necessarily having disease. And so when we look at disease, there are several classifications, right? We can have an acute disease, which can be very short in duration. It can be relatively severe, but most of the time it's often treatable. Right, you have a what they call an MI or a myocardial infarction or a decreased kidney function, right? This is where the healthcare provider can do certain things to treat that. Then we have subacute, where there are some acute features, and there can be what they call post acute treatment after discharge, where things happen afterwards. And of course there's chronic, which is uh, greater in length where it can be maybe less severe, but maybe an acute situation is still bothering them, it's troubling them, it will not go away. <clears throat> and so it is long and continuous in duration, and it can, can progress and lead to other comorbid conditions where it can be somewhat controlled but still lead to problems. For example, a person can have a chronic condition um, that can lead to other complications like asthma, diabetes, or hypertension. So someone who maybe has diabetes can progress to have um, cardiovascular disease. So what's quality of life? This is going to be something that we see a lot in healthcare, whether you are in management, in a biotech or pharmaceutical industry, or a hospital manager, quality of life is going to be a popular term. This is used as an indicator of whether or not an individual, so it's the, the person, the individual's perspective, whether or not they're satisfied with the experiences that they're receiving uh, in their health care. Are they comfortable? Are they, be are they being treated with respect? Is their information being um, held following privacy laws or HIPAA? Do they feel safe and secure? And is there some autonomy, right? Is there some decision-making on their end in their treatment regimen? And so this also can be, uh, quality of life can also include just the general overall satisfaction with life, including self-perceptions of health, especially after medical intervention. And so the goal in quality of life is to have a positive effect on a person's ability to function and to um, meet their obligations of everyday day life, but to also feel a sense of self-worth. And so there are multiple determinants of health, right? One of them can be the environment that you live in. Sometimes people often have poor health because 
uh, physically or socially because of the environment that they live in or the culture that they live in. There can also be behavioral or lifestyle factors that contribute to a person's health, such as diet, the food that they eat. These can cause um, some of the most significant healthcare problems. And while environment isn't necessarily always something that one can control, often behavior and lifestyle modifications are highly controllable. And these are usually the first things that providers MCOs, insurance companies recommend in the treatment of disease, both mental and physical. Heredity can also be a determinant of health, right? These are the genetic factors that you get from your parents. These factors can predispose an individual, uh, unfortunately, to certain types of diseases. Um, there can be what they call somatic or germline mutations for certain types of cancers, for example. And of course, lifestyles and habits get passed on through our parents and these can impact not only our health but the health of our offspring as well and then medical care which is access to adequate and preventative and curative service healthcare services are also something that is a determinant of our health as well do you have access to health care do you not have access to health care, right? Not having access to health care can help make a situation worse. And so let's talk about cultural beliefs and values, right? Every um, person and every society has their own value systems, and so this determines society's ideals and beliefs about health. There are many traditional cultural beliefs and values in the United States that are based off very conservative principles of market justice, these go back to the foundation of our country, and as we talked about last week is why we probably do not have a government-funded and centralized healthcare system of social medicine like other countries. Now, changing demographics can lead to uh, a state of flux or changes in cultural beliefs and values, such as uh, millennials, right, or Gen Z, and then these can then have a ripple effect on what type of changes are made to healthcare. I think the Affordable Care Act is a really good example of that. All right, so let's look at the distribution of healthcare. No society, right, to be fair, uh, last week we talked about all the different countries. No society has a perfectly equitable method to distribute uh, their resources. Resources are always gonna be limited, and unfortunately, in today's day and age, demand is always going to be greater than the resources available. Um, each country is going to have their own perspective due to culture on how they want to allocate those resources, right? And so some may be more generous than others because of their culture, while others may be less generous on the perception of resource allocation. And this is fueled by values and belief systems. And so we'll talk about this a little bit more, but these uh, perceptions of what is equitable access to healthcare. These are addressed by the theories of both market justice and social justice. All right, so what is market justice, otherwise known as the economic good, right? This is theoretically the fair distribution of health to the market in a free economy. And so this is where medical services are given or distributed on the basis of a person's willingness and ability to pay. And so looking at market justice, Healthcare is an economic good, right? And it's governed by free market forces. Individuals, again, theoretically, are responsible for their own achievements, and people are making, again, in theory, rational choices in their decision to buy healthcare products and services. They're consulting with their physicians, who, in theory, are doing what's best for the patient, not them or their hospital. And these types of marketplaces work best without interference from the government, in theory. And so market justice is the production of health care, and this is determined by how much consumers are willing and able to buy at the current prevailing price. There are limitations to access, right? So think of your economics classes with demand-side rationing. Or, or price rationing, and we'll talk about both of those more in the semester. And the focus is going to be on the individual instead of the collective responsibility for health. And if you see here in Table 2-1, there's some really good comparisons between 
market justice and social justice as well. This would be something I would probably keep handy and use to study for the midterm exam. All right, so what are the limitations of market justice? Well, this doesn't necessarily rectify human concerns that are contributing to health, such as crime, illiteracy, and homelessness, right? These can significantly weaken the fabric of our society, <clears throat> and individual health issues can have a negative impact on the society of which they live. And this, this, is, this doesn't necessarily translate well in the healthcare delivery system. And so now there's social justice or the good society. And again, this is theoretical, and this would be uh, kind of the antithesis of capitalism or, or market justice. Uh, in this theory, we have the equitable distribution of health care and the viewpoint that, well, this is society's responsibility. And so in this perspective, it's best when a central agency, like a government, is responsible for the production and distribution of health care. So like the UK model would be closer to this than in the United States. Under this model, they see health care as a social good. And they believe that this should be collectively financed and available to every single citizen, regardless of income. And so the principles that fall under social justice are that health care should be based on need as opposed to cost. The viewpoint that there is a shared responsibility for health, right, because there could be many factors outside a person's control that could have brought on the condition. And there's the principle that there is a belief that there's an obligation to the collective good. And by doing so, um, you're taking into consideration that an individual's health does affect the entire community. So it's in your best interest, according to this theory, to make sure that everyone is healthy because it affects you and the community that you live in. So the principles of social justice, they believe uh, under this theory that the government rather than the market can make rational and uh, plans and best decide the quantity of health care. So in this theory, there's the assumption that there's no personal interest, that, there, that it's being done completely logical and rational, and that it will be equally distributed amongst all citizens. And so in this process, there's rational plan, or there's logical planned rationing, or supply side rationing. We'll talk more about that, the different mechanisms of supply side rationing. <clears throat> but essentially, the government is limiting the supply of certain healthcare services to minimize costs, but also to provide equality amongst those um, recipients. And the higher you get in the specialization of healthcare needs, the more rationing there is. And so there's been a shift away from market justice in the mid 1960s. We see that with the uh, evolution, or rather beginning of Medicare and Medicaid, there's been a gradual move more and more from market justice to social justice, which has led to an increased government role in the healthcare system and more interactions between the market and social justice in the United States, more of an um, integration or blending or a tug and pull, so to speak. And so let's talk about some specific examples. We have the Healthy People's Initiative. This is a 10-year plan with certain specific national health objectives being held in mind. And this was founded on the integration of medical care and prevention for health promotion and education. And so there are three goals in the Healthy People's Initiative, collaboration, empowerment, and measurement. And so we talked a little bit about this last week. You can see this done a lot in communities that are adversely affected by the negative impact of lack of health care where education is being done in order to um, preemptively negate um, bad health. And so we also have Healthy People 2020 goals, right? They're looking to attain higher quality, longer lives, free of preventable disease, injury, or unnecessary premature death looking at achieving health equity. So we see a lot of social justice uh, elements here, eliminating disparities, trying to improve the health of all groups equally, uh, creating social and physical environments that promote the good of all. Think of social justice as kind of a idea, a utopian idea, and wanting to provide quality of life 
and healthy development and health behaviors across all life stages. So very interesting concepts here between market justice and social justice, especially when you integrate uh, your personal faith, uh, especially the Christian faith, and what does that look like, um, what is representative on the market side, and what is representative of the social side. So very interesting to take into consideration, and uh, there will be some questions that address this uh, here in the semester. So public health, right, this is a focus on improving the health of the general population and their well-being. Um, you're focusing on determinants, so you want to improve the overall nation's health or a region's health. And what you're trying to do in through public health policy is resolve or eliminate disparities amongst vulnerable populations and kind of create a framework that um, embodies a lot of the uh, social justice values that we talked about earlier. So here you see figure 2-4. This uh, talks a lot about the different determinants, so social determinants, behavioral, demographics, and then remember earlier we talked about the four elements to health being physical, mental, social, and spiritual, and so those are taken into consideration as well. And how can these be determinants of health in a society? And so what are the social determinants of health, right? This type of framework or approach to health and society is going to look at demographics, personal behaviors. Uh, that's going to be done through accumulating data and looking at community level inequalities and kind of determining how these factors combine to define the influence on health of those people in that said area. So some personal demographics, right, would obviously be race and ethnicity, also age, also sex, and how do these personal demographics directly contribute to vulnerability levels? So for example, um, in prostate cancer, you would have African American men and Asian men are much higher risk of developing prostate cancer, and if those patients become metastatic in their prostate cancer, they have a much shorter life expectancy. So a public health policy might be, if, if that is increasing, is to provide education to those communities to maybe do preventative screening up front to minimize the cost associated in caring for those people and also to maximize life expectancy. And so that would be an example of what we've been talking about. And unfortunately, as in many, many areas in life, in healthcare, there are going to be social and income inequalities. And obviously, that's going to contribute to disparities in health, as it does in other areas like housing, etc., etc. And so let's talk about medical care determinants. The medical care system focuses primarily on treating illnesses or poor health, right? It doesn't necessarily focus on maintaining health and what you can do to prevent health, it's more reactive. All right, so what are the social and medical points of intervention? Uh, reductions in health disparities are obtainable through interventions. So when we look at what is an intervention, right, there are four types of strategies to intervene. There can be social or medical care policy, and those can be national or regional or institutional. There can be community-based interventions like through education or free uh, healthcare clinics or seminars. There can be very specific healthcare interventions and interventions done on the individual level like behavioral modifications. So policy interventions, these are basically going to be public policy that directly focuses on the welfare of uh, the nation or region or city. Like we said, there are community-based interventions um, like education. So you see here uh, neighborhood poverty would be a good example of a community-based intervention because poverty can impact the level of health care one is able to obtain. There can be health care interventions. So an example would be using what they call an EMR electronic medical record or an EHR electronic health record to coordinate care for populations that are known to have multiple chronic and acute conditions. So 
EHRs or EMRs are really great ways to track, um, coordinate, compile data to create really reasonable um, healthcare interventions. And of course, as we talked about, there are individual level interventions like doing behavioral modifications in order to positively influence health. So like not smoking to reduce lung cancer or um, having daily exercise in order to reduce obesity and diabetes. And so in conclusion for this chapter, folks, the healthcare delivery system in the U.S. is driven by the medical model, which emphasizes illness rather than wellness, um, or as I like to say, more reactive than proactive. And the holistic concepts of healthcare, along with preventative and health promotional efforts, need to be adopted in order to significantly improve the health of Americans. However, whether you're using the social justice model or the market justice model or a combination thereof still has yet to be determined. And so improvements in health are going to require not just uh, governmental or regional or community initiatives, but they're going to require individual responsibility as well, working together as a community and looking at initiatives to work together to find um, improvements in health for all individuals. All right. Thank you, friends, and uh, thanks for a great week, and look forward to week two.